Our coverage of last night's debate continues, and we have third-party candidates in the House here at Rising. Chase Oliver, the Libertarian Party presidential candidate, is in the studio. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me today. I imagine a lot of Americans are wanting to hear from candidates outside of the two-party system after last night. We certainly think so. Uh, give us your reaction to what you saw on the debate stage last night? Well, I think what we saw was, uh, you know, Donald Trump doing his standard Donald Trump thing, and then Joe Biden being very underwhelming. I think the lowered expectations, you know, I honestly went into this debate saying, I think Republicans are making a mistake by lowering the expectations so much that as long as Biden doesn't trip over his own feet, he'll see, be seen as successful. He clear, he did not clear that bar. He went way under even the expectations Republicans were throwing at him. And I think Democrats are panicking right now. Mm. What issues do you think you know the Libertarian Party and your candidacy bring that were not covered in the debate last night? Well, you know, I don't think uh, we saw anybody you know, speaking up for the innocent people in Palestine who have died from the results of the airstrikes that we saw. You know, I support Israel's right to respond to a terrorist attack on October 7th, but I think what they've done and the way they've done it has created a lot of casualties that were not mentioned last night uh, when discussing the Israel-Gaza war. And I really think, you know, on the issue of being pro-choice, which I am, Donald or uh, Joe Biden really dropped the ball. He had a chance to, he had an easy layup to talk to his base and he couldn't do that. Instead, he wandered off into talking about Lincoln Riley. Were you surprised by the Democratic reaction and the reaction from the liberal media? I mean, we saw CNN in full on panic mode last night. Van Jones, David Axelrod talking about how much they love the president, but it might be time for him to step aside. Frankly, it sounded like an intervention. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, what has happened with a lot of the Washington insiders is they've been trying to deny themselves over and over again, saying, oh, he's just stuttering. It's just, you know, it's fine. He's fine. And then when it was brought in for the American people, like we now see loud and clear that there is a real, real need for some uh, change in the Democratic Party. And I would not be surprised if they, uh, there's not a huge movement to get Biden to step down. They were both uh, asked questions about the national debt, the economic situation of the country. Obviously, both Republicans and Democrats are responsible for contributing to that uh, problem. I saw in some of the counter-programming that RFK Jr. was doing during the debate, he really highlighted that um, issue, how, again, both Republicans and Democrats are responsible for this. What did you make of, of their answers on the debt subject? Well, I just think, of course, uh, they're weak on that subject because they have no real defense for the fact that they've been adding trillions and trillions of dollars to our debt. Donald Trump added uh, more than any other president in a four-year period. So the idea of fiscal conservatism got totally tossed out the window. Uh, I think this is why it's important to have a libertarian voice who's reminding people that, hey, the first way we start paying down the debt and deficit is to balance the budget and to start getting our economy under control and stop with the inflation that we're all feeling. And no Nobody addressed that. The fact that our debt and deficits are actually driving the inflation we feel because when we print trillions of dollars out of thin air, it devalues the dollar everybody has in their pocket or their bank account. And that's affecting American families right here, right now. And they're feeling the crunch. What is the case you make to voters coming out of last night? Which I think some people expected Joe Biden to perform the way he did. Some people maybe expected Trump to perform the way he did. But I still think it shocked the nation to see their mental state, well, Biden's mental state, and to see Trump sort of speaking in hyperbole, but very seriously. What do you tell voters about the potential future of a multi-party system and its possibility now? Well, I, I think voters right now got to see loud and clear as to why the two-party system is broken, why we continue to get lesser and lesser candidates uh, because of the way the system is set up. And right now, voters are really dissatisfied. And I wouldn't be surprised if we have the most number of independent votes outside of the two-party system in this election uh, in the last 20 years. Like, this is a huge sea change. It's a great uh, chance for libertarians and others to really put their name out there. And I'm looking forward to reaching out to voters and saying, you know, I, I was jokingly saying, I'm under 70. I speak in complete sentences. I'm not a convicted <laughs> felon. I'm your man. But a lot of people are like, wow, that is a bar we need to clear. And neither of the candidates on stage last night were doing that. What did you make of the two candidates' uh, attitudes toward foreign policy? Trump, of course, has been one of the least interventionist Republicans in modern history. He's moved the party away from its very neoconservative bent. Um, but where do you differ from him specifically on your foreign policy stances? Well, I think his foreign policy is quite erratic. You know, he talks about how he didn't start any new wars, but he also, uh, you know, drone bombed more in four years than Obama did in eight. And so he still exported our uh, values militarily through the drone bomb all over the world. He talks about not starting new wars, but then he brags about selling arms to Saudi Arabia, who's 
persecuting a war against people right now in Yemen. And so it's a very erratic foreign policy that's not really based in principle. Libertarians, we support being non-interventionist because we know the best way to export our values is through diplomacy, free trade, and voluntary exchange, and not trying to militarize the world. And you know, Trump talks a good game, but he still drone bombs all over the world when he was president. If I can follow up on that, just on the on the exporting free trade and, and that being sort of a driver of liberalizing other countries, uh, we haven't really seen that be the case in China, which we opened up global trade with them you know, 40, 50 years ago, and we've actually seen them continue to commit a lot of human rights abuses. So what is the evidence for this free market-based approach to uh, to promoting peace around the world? Well, I think if we continue to press for free trade and we tear down these tariff barriers and continue talking free trade with China, uh, we're gonna see them continue to try to pump up and manipulate their currency until eventually that bubble bursts. And once it does, you're gonna see the people of China wanting market liberalization and wanting better practices from their government and tearing down kind of the centralized authority that is in China. I think that's a far better way to attack China economically than to try to put up trade barriers that actually affect the consumers here in the United States. China does not pay the tariffs that Donald Trump instilled or that Joe Biden has now doubled and tripled down on. We pay those things. And so if we want to compete against China, we do it in a fair open market. We let them try to uh, pump themselves up and eventually their bubble bursts. On Ukraine, Trump promised that if he is reelected be between the election and him taking office, he will put an end to that conflict. He really did hit Biden on giving rhetorical support to y Ukraine, defending themselves, you know, to the last man, the, the, this really existential conflict with Russia. Biden in the debate repeatedly said, you know, Putin's going to conquer all of Europe if we don't, you know, stand. And, and there was a lot of conversation about, well, is this World War III? Trump saying World War III is more likely if you have Biden again. Biden saying the reverse. Um, what did you make of, of those answers? Well, I think both of them are erratic. I think, honestly, either one of these men can bring us closer to World War III based on their foreign policy of, and the records that they had as president. Uh, I would like to see an end to the Ukraine war. Uh, do I think that a president-elect can do that between the time he's elected and the time he takes office? I, I don't really know because there's, that's never been done before. There's no real mechanism to get that done. You have no official authority until you enter office. And so uh, if Trump were to be elected and you were to want to see, I want to see what that really looks like. Uh, but. As far as I see right now, that's just a rhetorical flourish from the, the former president until he gets into office if he were to be reelected. One of the biggest topics last night we heard about was immigration. And this is one of the issues that I think your position is very different from both candidates. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I want to see a 21st century Ellis Island. I recognize we have a crisis at our southern border, but that is not caused by migration. That is caused by government's inability to properly process people who want to come here and work and create economic output in this country, create uh, you know, a prosperity, create businesses. That is what I want to see. And so the way we do that is we streamline the process, come through a port of entry, declare who you are, get vetted, come in and come to work. Because when we vet the 99.9% .9 of the peaceful people who want to come here and work, we can put our law enforcement eyes on those who are human trafficking for the purposes of labor or sexual exploitation, people who are creating coercive and fraud by putting uh, fentanyl into Xanax pills and trying to sell them north of the border. Those are the crimes we want to punish instead of people who just want to peacefully come here to work. And we have to simplify the process. It's too complicated, it's too costly, it takes too much time, and now we're seeing the effects of that on our southern border. There are limits to a just process them all policy, though. We've seen that the killers of Jacqueline Nungary in Texas, for example, were both individuals who were stopped by Border Patrol at the southern border, um, received uh, alternatives to detention, ankle bracelets, and then went on to rape and murder this girl under a bridge. So for whatever reason, they weren't stopped through the processing system. I mean, do you have an idea of how processing needs to change in order to make sure individuals like that aren't coming in? Because clearly that's not the only solution to making sure that we're not importing criminals. Well, yeah, I recognize that no vetting process will be 100% foolproof to keep bad people out of the country. There's just no way. If that is your threshold, then we should just have no immigration at all, period, because there will always be bad people in the world. What we have to recognize, though, is that immigrants, both legal and illegal, commit less crime on average than native-born American people. So I don't want to paint every single person who wants to come to this country and work with somebody who came to this country and did something terrible. If you commit a crime like that, absolutely punish that person, and if they need to be deported, deport them immediately. Like, that is something we can, well, after they serve their time in prison. But yes, you punish criminals, but you don't punish people who are peacefully wanting to come here and work, which is what the vast majority of immigrants are. And right now they're stuck in a broken system that doesn't allow them to do that. Another um, key exchange very early on the debate was on COVID. Um, uh, Trump uh, hitting Biden, saying that uh, Biden inherited uh, the Trump administration's massive push on therapeutics and vaccines. And then he went after Biden for having done a vaccine mandate. Uh, Trump 
was pro-vaccine but uh, against doing the mandates. And they had a you know big exchange on COVID, Trump pointing out that more people actually died from COVID during the Biden administration than during the Trump administration. Um, what is the libertarian view of how COVID should have been handled in a future pandemic? So the libertarian position, first off, we shouldn't have had governors locking down businesses all over the country. We lost so, many, so much economic output because of this arbitrary lockdowns. And we shouldn't be having government mandating medical behavior. You know, if you believe that taking a vaccine is a good idea, take a vaccine, live your life. And if you're a property owner, you can determine determine who can come on your property, all these things are removed from the realm of government. What we had during COVID was on both sides wanting to clamp down on what you could hear, what you could say, and, and what is the recommended information. And that increased under Joe Biden too. So like, uh, for me, get the government out of my life. I shouldn't need the government to, to tell me, hey, you need to go to your doctor, you maybe need to take care of yourself. That's something that's between me, my doctor, my own conscience. I don't need a government bureaucrat and central planners to be doing that. And I don't need them to be spending trillions of dollars of taxpayer money that could have just been better allocated uh, otherwise. On this exact topic, abortion was another one of the big issues they discussed. We had Donald Trump say some pretty extreme things that the Democrats want abortions late term, nine months and after birth. Of course, Joe Biden corrected the record. His answer was filled with gaffes, but he pointed out that potentially if there was a six week ban or some kind of ban passed through Congress, he would veto it, but believes Trump would sign it. If we get to the point of having Congress pass this legislation and you were in office as president, would you sign a national ban like that? No, I would veto a ban like that. I don't support a ban on abortion. I, I support women's bodily autonomy and their right to make their own decisions. Uh, I support the standards of Roe v. Wade. You should be able to receive an abortion up to the point of viability, post viability. That should be done between a doctor who's just saying that the life of the mother is at risk. That is where most Americans are at. It's where Joe Biden was at with the Hyde Amendment too, not having public taxpayer dollars going to fund abortion, which is where I'm at. But he got pushed to the left, Trump got pushed to the right, and this just speaks to the hyperpolarization of this issue. I think this should be down to the most local government, which is your own self-governance, your own individual choice. It shouldn't be a state or a nation state determining your bodily autonomy. I would rather you, your doctor, your own conscience determine that up to the point of viability and post-viability, a doctor should be able to determine if your life is at risk and uh, allow for that. So if there were a, a ban that came through the federal government and came to your desk as president that banned abortions after the point of viability with exceptions for health of the mother, is that something that you would sign? I think that's the Roe v. Wade standard. Yeah, that would be codifying basically Roe v. Wade and Casey into law. And I think that's where most Americans are. And I think that's where we need to be in terms of body autonomy and the way uh, we respect women's rights to make their own choices about their own reproductive health. After what happened uh, last night in the debate stage, I think a lot of Americans who tuned in might be paying attention to third party candidates uh, for the first time, uh, seeing, well, are there other alternatives out there? Tell us a little bit about what you're doing in, in terms of your campaigning, where you're going, the Libertarian Party's um, access to the ballots in the many states. The Libertarian Party has been on, I think, every state in previous elections. and I. My understanding is there could be some difficulty with that this year. Um, obviously, the two-party system has made it very difficult for alternative perspectives to be represented on the ballot. Talk to us a little bit about your you know, quest for making your case to the American people. Yeah, so currently we're on the ballot in 38 states and growing. We're going to have the highest ballot access, I believe, of all of the uh, independent or third-party candidates. And so that gives voters across the country the ability to choose outside of Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Uh, we're going to be campaigning heavily all across the country. You know, As opposed to Donald Trump and Joe Biden, who will be focusing on four or five swing states. My goal is to get out to as many states as possible, get as many libertarian voters out so we can build the libertarian party across the country when things like ballot access, major party status, help local candidates win their elections. And so this is my goal. So I'm not focusing on two or three states. I'm trying to be as spread out as I can. Me and my running mate, Mike Termot, are splitting the country up right now, traveling all over the place. And uh, I, I think it speaks to the energy that our campaign has. That's a difference that we have, obviously, between Joe Biden and even Donald Trump. Uh, me being under the age of 40, I have the energy, the enthusiasm, the drive to get on the campaign trail as much as possible. I'm going to be doing a lot of early mornings and a lot of late nights, and I just don't see that coming from Donald Trump or Joe Biden, or frankly, a lot of the other candidates. You could be our first millennial president, I understand. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chase Oliver, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. More Rising right after this.